And that's why you have to have a good portfolio construction strategy. You will have chaos. We see that in various different ways, but you really see it in the secondary market where you price your whole trade around the performance of two of these high value companies. And it's the third and fourth one that drive most of the outcome, not the two that you're pricing around. Why is top tier a better partner than other fund of funds or other LPs? We definitely try to help our partners build their businesses. We help them think about capital. We help them with recruiting. We help them think about how to manage their cap tables. I've helped several firms restructure and gone through litigations with them, come out the back end in a much better spot. And that's primarily because... As the founder of Top Tier, do you worry that the DNA that you inject in the company will be lost in future generations? Well... For more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market, make sure to subscribe below. David, I've been looking forward to this interview since Rebecca from Node introed us last year. Welcome to the 10X Capital Podcast. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Really, really excited. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited as well. So you started in 1993. Tell me about how you started Top Tier Capital. Top Tier actually started in, in uh, 1999. I started in this industry in 1993, just to be clear. But our original history in the financial services industry goes back actually to 1984. Uh, for better or for worse, I'm an old dude, but um, <laughs> seen, a few, seen a few cycles. Premise was access to Silicon Valley, uh, providing institutions uh, things they couldn't get access themselves to. And then over time, we've grown the firm 100% uh, focused on venture capital. Uh, we today buy funds uh, globally. Uh, again, majority of that is here in Silicon Valley. And then we also do secondaries in those funds. And then finally, we do direct investments alongside our managers in, in, in a co-investment format. So tell me about your portfolio construction. In our fund of funds, uh, we use uh, somewhere between roughly around 20% of the fund of fund portfolio's capital to provide cash flows as we uh, allow the venture capital funds we've committed to, to to incubate. On the front end, we're buying secondaries to get cash flow going in the portfolio as well as mitigate the J curve. And then we do co-investments to add capital in multiple years three or four, kind of between years three and five. And then by then the primaries are really starting to work uh, the primaries being the fund commitments. And uh, as those start to work, they kind of carry, if you will, the portfolio uh, through the back end. If we do everything right, we should double or triple our money. Are the directs made to minimize the J curve? If you think about buying a fund, it usually takes your, you know, six plus years before you start to see really decent liquidity in venture capital land. And so, uh, and if you're doing a seed fund, uh, which is quite a large population of investors, those funds could take 10 to 12 years before you start to see liquidity. So we we came up with a strategy of adding secondaries to create uh, both multiple lift, uh, taking into consideration the discount you're purchasing them at, as well as if we purchase the secondaries correctly, we should get some uh, reasonably uh, quick liquidity. So if you look at our history over the last 20 years, our average fund to fund commitment ends up being at, at peak about 75% drawn. You're getting DPI back before you call the capital? Yeah, exactly. Why not have different funds for each strategy? Well, and that's what we've done. We, you know, so to grow the firm, if you think about venture capital and access and primary fund commitments, there's only so much capacity with, with the best managers. So you, if you're gonna raise a billion dollars and wanted a concentrated portfolio, you couldn't buy 50 million of each manager very effectively. The smaller funds in particular, you wouldn't be able to get 50 million in those things. And in the bigger ones, those, those tend to be, uh, have a different return profile and over time, sometimes they're too big. What we did was uh, to grow capital. So today we manage uh, a little over $8 billion. Um, to grow capital, um, we've essentially grown horizontally, David, as you suggested. So we've added product, the focus that's taken that whole cash flow concept of mitigating the J-curve, and we have a product exclusively focused on that. We call it our velocity product. And the intention there is to get basically our cost back in less than three years on our secondaries and, and generate a multiple of north of three times. Then we've also added product around the seed activity where people want pure long-term equity accretion and aren't as worried about cash flow or duration. Four years ago, we added a, a product to focus on Europe uh, as we've had quite a bit of success in Europe. Uh, in addition to that, we felt Europe was undervalued versus Asia uh, in a way that um, that would become a more attractive place to, to deploy capital in the venture space. What are the forces behind why Europe is currently undervalued? Some of it's the cost of doing business. Um, for better or for worse, it, it is pretty bureaucratic versus the U.S. And there's always been a thought that Europe's a nice place to visit, but not necessarily a nice place to do, to do business unless you get to critical scale. What's happened over the last 30 years is we've had a slow, sort of continued growing homogenization of the workforce. So if you're a college student in Poland or a college student in France, 
you're not worried necessarily about working locally, you're worried about working at the best company. And that best company might be in Germany, it might be in the UK. So there's a lot more mobility in the workforce. And hubs are really becoming very established. If you think about gaming in Helsinki or, or you know, with Spotify success, there's quite a bit going on in the entertainment world in, in Stockholm. UK and Paris have become uh, one of the world's leading hotbeds for artificial intelligence programming. Valuations are typically 20 or 30 percent lower. And there was a period around 2016 where they were probably half the U.S. valuations. Many skeptical people would say that Europe is cheaper because the returns, the exits are cheaper as well. What would you say to them? I wouldn't disagree. I, Europe's biggest Achilles heel, I think, at this point is the capital markets. The most successful companies in Europe are still going public in the U.S. And that trade from a European point of view is actually a more comfortable trade than from an Asian point of view. And so I, I think that will continue. I think NASDAQ will be a beneficiary of tech startups coming out of Europe. Europeans, if they could do anything to help themselves, would to try and uh, sort ways to build a better capital markets. What would you say to Ch Charles Michel, former prime minister of Belgium and president of the European Council? How would you encourage him to improve economic development in Europe? Get the alignments correct around incentivizing employees and employers, primarily around taxes, long-term capital gains. One of the things that made Silicon Valley work early was economic incentives for employees by giving them you know, options and equity value in the companies. In Europe, that's been a highly taxed activity. Uh, it's getting better, both Germany and France and the UK. And I think recently the Netherlands have all adjusted their taxes, but it's not not nearly as, as motivating as, as, as it is still here in the United States. So. I think that's one of the biggest problems. It's like QSBS, but the equivalent for, for Europe. Yeah, QSBS is fantastic for, for private investors, um, especially um, over the last 10 years as companies have gone public. Every dollar put into venture capital you know, results in 10, 20, whatever <laughs> number, number of dollars in the economy. And the world's figuring that out. I mean, one of the reasons that Germany uh, and now France are in, you know, invest, they're putting up capital to help companies get started is because they do see the benefits of the economic growth from for tech and technology startups. And you know, the same thing now being pushed through in Japan. Korea has been there for a while. You mentioned the, the globalization of Europe in terms of it being a mon monoculture in terms of tech. Has, has COVID be, been the main accelerant? What has accelerated that over the last five, 10 years? COVID certainly hasn't hurt. Um, yeah, you allow, it allowed entrepreneurs to hire somebody in, in, in the Baltics that they might not necessarily have done so because they could allow people to work remotely. And I, th I think that's helped them to explore talent in those regions. So if you go through the history of Silicon Valley, I mean, things started percolating here in the late 50s after a lot of the research that was coming out of the Second World War. I mean, Europe as an EU is 40, 50 years old now. And so you're starting to get comfort. 20 years ago, your, your parents would want you to work down the street. And now they want you to work in a company that's thriving. So it's just time, David. And then some of it is success. Um, I think originally with Skype and then and then recently with things like Spotify, it shows that, you know, a little country like Sweden can distribute music to the world and build a thriving. Stockholm, if I'm correct, has the third largest per capita startups on the planet after Silicon Valley and Tel Aviv. Correct. Very successful firms there, too. Is there alpha in having a very good brand as a fund of fun and why? As it relates to top tier, the branding has been built really based on our efforts to be good partners and to do that consistently over a long period of time. That then creates a flywheel of deal flow, both at the co-investment level as well as at the general partner level. And in that flywheel, we always also try to be good partners. We don't buy everything we see, but most people leave our meetings feeling that they got value from them. Some of it's our advice, some of it's our practical approach. Uh, we're incredibly transparent. You know, I came from a very intense uh, customer service industry, investment banking, and I was just sort of surprised how uh, capital really, meaning investors and money, didn't really empathize with the person across the table. Zero sum game. Yeah. And I sort of felt, gee, that's ass backwards. He's trying to build a business too. And so he should at least have a very good view of one, how we feel, but two, maybe things he might need to work on. That's been going on for almost 25 years now in a way that um, it builds a ton of goodwill and it's been consistent across the firm and our employees and how we structure our legal contracts, how we conduct ourselves in negotiations, et cetera, in a way that really, really valuable. The persistence of top quartile, University of Chicago just put out a study, I think, believe it's 47% continued to be in the top quartile. So 
on average, you would expect 25% are random. It's actually 47% of, so I, I think you got, I think you got the right name. Our fund managers and our investor or, you know, our investments are like it a lot because they go home and tell their, their, their wife and kids that they, they got a commitment from top tier and <laughs> our competitors find it annoying because it's presumptuous. We continue to, which gives us brand appeal in a variety of different ways. So you highlighted something we've never talked about, which is how you treat GPs when you say no, it's an underreported thing. And, but when you do say yes, why is top tier a better partner than other fund of funds or other LPs? We help our partners build their businesses. We help them think about capital. We help them with recruiting. We help them think about how to manage their cap tables. A lot of our peers do the same. I suspect we're probably more intentional there. We're constantly there trying to help as opposed to holding the, the, the poker cards you know, close to our chest. So when people are going sideways, we can give lots of advice. I've helped several firms restructure, and that's primarily because, you know, odds are there's two or three LPs in that mix beyond, beyond ourselves that we've introduced the fund to and helped uh, help them build their capital base. And we've just done this religiously in a way that builds that goodwill. And then you've been working around venture capital since 1993, over yep. 30 years. Mm -hmm. You've seen a lot of funds come and go. What do you see in the firms that are able to handle generational transfers effectively? There's tends to be a thoughtful leader that understands that holding all of the capital and or economics is not a long-term success story. The two most successful firms that have done multiple generational transfers have been Sequoia and Axel, and they were very aggressive on transferring leadership to younger generations early. If you go back to Don Valentine and Mike Moritz and Doug Leone, and then Doug transferring it to Olaf, or Recent roll off recently, uh, Jim Breyer was early at Excel uh, in, the, in the late 90s when Mark Patterson and his partner Jim Schwartz stepped down. Jim, you know, transferred to the current team relatively early. Jim's still investing, but it's all part of that sort of cultural activity. One of the ways that works is some of the older folks that are still allowed to stick around and invest in the funds. And I think if you allow the transitioning partners to keep themselves in the game a bit, I think that makes it a lot easier. In the small handful of transitions that I've seen, it's been started 10, sometimes 15 years before the transition happened. That's my, that's Do you see my that point. as well? We really enjoy uh, actually helping firms build and helping investing in some of these younger funds. It's been a lot of fun. As the founder of Top Tier, do you worry that the DNA that you inject in the company will be lost in future generations? No. I've always kind of tried to coach along the way. I guess it's now five years ago when we went from a managing partner model to a management committee model. And that's been now really operating relatively very smoothly for the last three to four years. We'll, from that model, start to transition uh, some of us off the management committee over the next three to four years and some others folks on. And we think that's the right way to run our organization. Fund of funds, uh, the analogy I like to use is kind of a Sherpa to, to bring people into the asset class. Let's say I started an endowment and it's $50 billion. I've been investing in mostly public stocks. Now I want to go into alternatives. How would you advise the institution that is going into the venture asset class first start that process and how should that evolve? It depends on kind of the macro um, allocation approach you want to take. But, um, you know, historically that number, the private equity exposure in an endowment of that size was historically around at the low end, kind of 5% was in privates. That's grown today. That now is approaching 20%. And so if you're running a $50 billion program, like you described, venture is hard to put to work uh, at that scale unless you have some help. And there's two ways to do that. You can hire a consultant. The consultants, those folks will advise you on managers that they like. You can also hire a fund of funds and the fund of funds can get money to work for you quickly and then help you we do this actively, help our LPs then decide over time what they want to buy directly to lower their effective costs, if you will. How does that relationship go with LPs? So let's go back to this $50 billion endowment. Is there an implicit kind of co-invest in, I put in 50 million into top tier, I'll get 50 million in co-invest. How do you navigate that relationship? Historically, that investor is just getting started. The way we've tended to navigate it is uh, we give a lot of touch. We set up a, a consistent call, if you will. You know, Zoom's a wonderful thing. <laughs> you can do, you know, monthly, quarterly calls. We review pipelines. They have pipeline flow. We help them with that. 
We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsor. Most businesses use up to 16 tools to hire, manage, and pay their workforce. But there's one platform that's replaced them all. That's Deal. D-E-E-L. Deal is the all-in-one HR and payroll platform built for global work. The smartest startups in my portfolio use Deal to integrate HR, payroll, compliance, and everything else in a single product. Focus on what you do best. Scale your business and let Deal do the rest. Deal allows you to hire, onboard, and pay talent in over 150 countries, from background checks to built-in contracts. You can manage the entire worker lifecycle from a single and easy-to-use interface. Click the link in the show notes below to book a free, no-strings-attached demo with Deal today. I see a lot of spin-outs, uh, Wesley Chen, Thomas Tungus. Um, in our book, yeah. Uh, we're uh, both? We own them, them both, yes. Okay, excellent. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, two great examples. Highly, I was going to say they're highly oversubscribed. So what is the allure of spinouts, and why do you see alpha in spinouts? We try to basically track alpha. So inside firms, there are individuals that drive a lot of the success. They, a lot of times, want to go start their own organizations, and so we we try to pay attention to that. In the case of Wesley, I mean, it's he's been very successful over a very long period of time, and. And we'd known him, uh, oh gosh, six or seven years before he actually spun out. And, and the same thing is with Tomas. I think I met Tomas, um, I don't know, almost 10 years ago. What is the way that you provide the most value to spin outs in your portfolio? Venture is a long marathon. And there's an, an intention sometimes with folks that want to go off and start their own organization to think that they drove a lot of the economic value that they created in the portfolios where they sit. And a lot of that value, um, you could you could allocate to them, but a lot of it you need to allocate to the franchise. And so sometimes people spin out because they think it's all about them, and lo and behold, it wasn't. It's about a collection that made that work, right? The franchise, the partners, yourself. The biggest risk of spin outs is wanting to conquer the world uh, and realizing that, boy, it's a lot harder than I realized. We've, you know, for better or for worse, helped people edit their LP allocations so that they they can understand kind of who's long-term, who's not, and who's a tourist and, and you know, what's reliable and what's not. Outside of fund of funds, who are the best types of LPs to have on your cap table? I really think it's about the people um, at those institutions. I remember in 2003 when, when all the endowments went from, you know, 80% venture to 10, and some of our guys would come in and say, you know, we had 45 endowments and we only know two of the individuals. I recommend thinking of your, your capital base in thirds. And I think a third should be institutions like ourselves, you know, that are motivated to build firms and organizations around the success of your outcome. A third around uh, foundations and endowments, and then a third around, you know, pensions or the like. Family offices, some are very constructive uh, and some are very uh, flighty. I found a lot of the new entrants today are driven by, uh, you know, folks that have been successful over the last 20 years and want to put money to work in a new category, but they're really uh, using excess capital to do that as opposed to the core of an allocation. And so when when the core of their wealth starts to deteriorate, they pull that capital back and then all of a sudden this person who you thought was a reliable LP because they were so wealthy really um, isn't. And so that's, that's one thing to be worried about. Yeah. It's not unlike politics. Uh, last one in is first one out. You mentioned a third, a third, a third fund of funds, a third foundation endowments, and a third pension funds. Can you unpack that a little bit more? Is that, why would you recommend that? I'll talk about each one. The um, fund of fund space, that includes things like OCIOs. That includes consultants like Mercer and Cambridge. I mean, the, the problem is if you get half your fund in one of those consultants, which represents maybe 20 LPs, if they decide not to put a buy recommendation on you for the next fundraise, half your fund is gone. So you run that risk. The, the fund of funds like ourselves or, or the OCIO investors, we're motivated to make good decisions, but we're also motivated to find more capital to keep investing. So we're in this investment genre, if you will, uh, in, until we're not, which in most of us is you know, 30, 40 years, if you look at some of our peer group. We're gonna be around. So that's a reliable you know, uh, capital source. The endowments, um, have you know, you know a whole bunch of different things they're doing and have but they have a very long hold because they're looking for essentially long multiple uh so their duration is infinite which makes them attractive for venture why pension funds is it just sizing there's that but um it's just a reliable source of capital i mean 401ks have kind of changed that here domestically but in places like europe and asia there's if you go and look at the sovereign wealth activity and 
in, in Asia in particular, I mean, Korea's pension system is, is has way too much cash for domestic investment. Japan's the second largest pension system in the world. Now, Japan has got its own issues. So that's a complicated market. But uh, Australia has got a huge uh, pension community. I mean, it's just it's a category that, um, you know, has capital in it and is trying to figure out how to get good long term returns. And so today there's more buyers of that ecosystem for venture than there has been in probably 20 years. You mentioned you have eight billion under management. What have been your best practices for building relationships with your LPs? When we started the firm, we kind of came with this notion there were two customers. There were their investment clients and they were investor clients. Our investors are our LPs. So we are, again, very transparent. We spend a lot of time educating them. We do workshops all the time. We are on, you know, either on either through webinars or in person and try to become their reliable information source as well as performer in the venture capital category. Early on, we had several very large uh, investors um, in the sovereign wealth area in a way that kind of anointed us as an acceptable manager of capital in that category. And so we have a handful of sovereign wealth funds that we work with. Is that the key to unlocking new asset classes? You get that kind of lead investor, that anchor investor, and then other people start to take a look at, at you? It doesn't hurt. <laughs> I can say that much. I think it's patience. I always tell people when you're getting turned down, no is not now. What's the longest it's been between the first time you met somebody and, and the check that they wrote into top tier? It varies, but it's on an average kind of three to eight years. Yeah. And so you've got to be patient about getting in business, patient of building a business. But um, if, you, if you get it to a certain critical mass, it becomes pretty sticky. When you get the check, it scales. It starts to, yeah. So as we mentioned, you've been in venture since 1993. You have one of the most long durations in the asset class. What do you wish you knew when you started? When you're young, so 93, I was in my early 30s. I didn't realize how important the quality of people dictated the quality of the outcome. And I think at that age, you always think you're just smart enough. That you, that's, that's a given, but it's very, very important. The people are really important. In other words, starting a firm, starting to invest with an LP, uh, all of the above, it gets down to people. And then the other thing was just being confident in the tech cycle. You know, Moore's, people talking about Moore's Law and things of that nature, but one of the beauties of our business is we endlessly reinvent ourselves as far as investment opportunities are concerned. If you went and penciled out where uh, the semiconductor was going in the early 80s and what that was going to evolve into, what we're doing today doesn't seem so crazy or so inventive. And so, because I, I do think as investors, we get so wound up on near-term outcomes that we miss um, a lot of the long-term opportunity. And the best example is our trillion dollar market cap companies. Understanding how ownership works. If I had to step back and really sort of pencil out what works at scale and what's clear it works at scale is having enough ownership. And if venture capital, for better or for worse, is, isn't structured that way, your ownership's never gonna be at the same scale as if you buy a business. Is at the buyout level you own anywhere from you know 60 to 100 percent and so if you go back into the late 90s or if you go through this recent COVID period ownership is paramount to success uh, on, at the end of the day and it seems like i'm the last person in silicon valley that understands why it doesn't scale one theory that i have is that a certain gp will only have a finite amount of a plus opportunities one of the things that goes unreported is everybody has their a plus companies their a minus their a's their b pluses and maybe below that they don't invest but nobody thinks every next company is facebook so there's a finite amount of these really top top tier opportunities for lack of a better word and then everything else dilutes those opportunities it's absolutely right the, the problem is when you get started you don't know if you do a lot of math i mean at the end where the fund returners are are really in you know two or three standard deviations out the craziest stuff in the tails if you will is really where you get your, your best performance. And that's why you have to have a good portfolio construction strategy. Yeah. To plan for the chaos, yes. predictably unpredictable. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you will have chaos. We see that in various different ways, but you really see it in the secondary market where you price your, your investment, your whole trade around the performance of the two of these high value companies. And it's the third and fourth one that drive most of the outcome, not the two that you're pricing around. Well, David, this has been an absolute masterclass. I've been able to pick, pick the mind of one of the greatest minds uh, in the space. What would you like our uh, ever-growing listenership to know about you, about Top Tier, or anything else you'd like to shine a light on? Thank you. So a couple things. I, I think we're in, sitting in front of one of the larger tech reinvention cycles that we've ever seen in our lifetimes. 
we have a confluence of a ton of stuff coming together to create this from compute power to the cloud computing network to open source in a way that we think most of the tech stack gets reinvented in the next 10 years. And so we're super bullish on where we sit. The correction has provided us an entry price much more attractive than it was three years ago in a way that it's a great time to be a dollar cost buyer. And so buying portfolios like we do is kind of a cool thing. We're very excited about the things that the technology is going to help in the world from climate to healthcare to how we run our lives. So there's lots of things to be excited about. And so I appreciate you taking the time to spend, spend the morning with me. Thank you for imparting your, your knowledge of over three decades and for being so generous and ho hope to see you soon in person. Our pleasure. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Take care. By popular demand, the 10X Capital Podcast has officially launched our newsletter powered by Caria Labs, a full-service content marketing firm that's partnering with us on the newsletter. In our weekly newsletter, we will keep you updated on all things emerging managers and limited partners, including industry trends that are critical to know as an LP, VC, or founder. To subscribe to our totally free newsletter, please visit 10xcapitalpodcast.com. Again, that's 10xcapitalpodcast.com. We thank you for your support.